All right, well, we are on week six of our Renovate Revolution um, message series. And we've been talking about spiritual uh, transformation um, through the metaphor of kind of overthrowing this self-government, this bad self-government, deposing ourselves as Lord and King and uh, putting Jesus on the throne, right? So the past weeks, we've been looking at this from a uh, individual kind of perspective. We've been talking about individual transformation. But tonight, we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to look at this from a corporate perspective. Now, I've had a lot of jobs for a 54-year-old guy. Um, I've done everything from janitor to president of a company. I've worked on the, on the cleanup crew for a meat packing plant. And I've been like the general manager of large music stores. So, and kind of a bunch of stuff all in between there. But the hardest job that I've ever had is the ministry. It's also the best job I've ever had. Um, and there's several reasons for that. Um, we have a saying in the ministry, and that, that saying is, sheep bite. <laughs> you like my sheep? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I Googled it, and I, I Googled sheep bite, and that's what came up. So that's what I used. Huh? Yeah, it looks like my dog, kind of. If Jack had a baby with a, a, with a sheep, it would look like that. <laughs> anyway, so scripture refers to um, the followers of Jesus as sheep, and it refers to Jesus as the chief shepherd, and it refers to pastors sometimes as, as shepherds. And um, sheep bite is just a phrase that indicates that Christians tend to hurt each other. They tend to attack each other, and they even attack the shepherds who are there to um, kind of care for them. Now, why do we do that? Why do we bite each other? Well, that's what we're going to look at tonight. And we're going to look at it um, as an element of spiritual warfare because that's what it is. So we're looking at spiritual warfare, but we're going to look at an aspect of spiritual warfare that really almost always goes um, unnoticed and unaddressed. Um, so the title of my message tonight is The Fog of War. Now, all revolutions require a fight. All of them. Not, not necessarily violence, but all revolutions requ require some kind of fight. And, and that's, that's true also for the revolution that we've been talking about. Now, obviously this battle isn't isn't the same as the world's kind of battle, but the stakes are actually higher for the spiritual battle. Now, before I get into the specifics of this topic, um, it's important for us to establish that we are at war. We are at war. Now, I doubt that I have to convince any of you of that fact. Um, as a matter of fact, how many of you have noticed in the past week or two or three um, a heightened sense of spiritual warfare. Raise your hand. Wow. A good half or more of the room. Uh, and the rest of you, maybe you don't call it that, and maybe you don't recognize it as that, but are you experiencing, um, say, inordinate frustration or maybe a high level of um, relational conflict or... or um, maybe consistent nagging t uh, uh, irritation or, or temptation. Or... Now, the key word here is inordinate because all of those things are kind of normal parts of life, right? But when I say inordinate, I mean it's out of the ordinary. And you look at it and you go, why am I so angry? Or why am I so frustrated? Or why do I feel like, you know, it's like it just doesn't even make sense. Well, oftentimes this can in uh, <coughs> indicate um, spiritual warfare. And scripture often uses warfare terminology. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God 
that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So we are engaged in a fight against evil spiritual forces. That's what this is saying. But notice he says, um, we're to do this in his might. The battle's not ours. This isn't our war. This is God's war. And by the way, God wins. And we're to do this with his armor, right? That's what the earlier part of this passage says. Now, our enemy is the devil, and he leads a host of fallen angels or demons. And um, I want to look at a few attributes of this rebel prince. The devil is our enemy, and here's scripture to back up each of the points I'm making. He's our enemy. He wages war against us. He masquerades as an angel of light. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's a tempter. He's the accuser. And he's the father of lies. So those are some attributes of our enemy. Now keep these things in mind as we move through the heart of this message. Fog of war. What is fog of war? Well, fog of war, you probably, most of you probably already know, but for those who don't, it's a, it's a military term. And it just, it refers to what happens to people when they engage or experience a combat situation. And one of the definitions is uncertainty in situational awareness. Now, imagine that your company is uh, just moseying along, and all of a sudden you come under attack. And there's bombs dropping all around you. There's uh, bullets hitting all the stuff around you. Um, your adrenaline is spiking, and you're in this frenzy, and you don't know where the enemy is. You don't know how many of them there are, and you're just freaking out. Well, in those situations, even if you've experienced training for that type of scenario, you can still, it often happens that the troops will just start firing, sometimes indiscriminately, hopefully towards the direction that they think that the enemy fire is coming from. But in that scenario, you can end up shooting, even killing your own people, the good guys, the people that are on your side, okay? Now, I've never been in the military, personally, but I have experienced several times life-threatening situations. I grew up in a proverbial war zone um, where people were shot, they were stabbed. I've experienced stuff like this. I had a guy press a pistol against my head and, and tell me he was going to pull the trigger. He was robbing me. Another time, uh, we had our lives threatened as we were coming back from a show. I used to be in a rock band. This is me in the late 70s. This is the real That 70s Show, by the way. I mean, I even grew up in, this is Wisconsin. I grew up in Wisconsin. Well, we were coming back from a gig in Milwaukee, and um, we pulled up with our gear at probably 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning in my big blue step van. This is in the 70s, my big blue step van. And this is what we carried our gear in. And when we pulled up, um, you know, my brothers and friends who were helping us jumped out. And I was in the van getting stuff ready to unload. And I heard somebody scream my name, Greg! And, um, and there was commotion. I, I knew something bad was happening. So I, I got to the door, and I had a decision to make at that moment. I, I kept a shotgun right next to the back door of the step van because, you know, I had friends that died. I, I had been shot at. Um, I had been stabbed. I had been through a lot of stuff, and people really wanted our gear. So I kept a shotgun in the van. Now, I had a really critical moment. Now, all of this is a split second of time. I heard my name. I heard the commotion. I went like this, and I went, I'm not going to grab the gun. I left it there. I got out, 
As soon as I stepped out of the step van, six or seven guys started coming towards me, and I'm like, oh, crap. They, they were waiting. They were, there was, uh, we were ambushed. Um, and all, all of six or seven of them jumped on me. Um, I didn't really stand any chance. I fell to the ground. They were pounding on me. They were kicking me. And I, all I did was I just, I turtled up. I just got into a ball. I covered my face. I covered my stomach. And, and they were just kicking me and punching me. And I actually fared pretty well. I had knots all over my head. I had bruises all over my body. And the worst thing was one of them got their foot between my arms and it hit me in the mouth and my tooth went through my lip. Uh, but other than that, I was, I was battered. But, so I'm laying there battered and most of the guys, you know, they beat on me for a while and, they, and then they went off. And there was a couple of them left lingering, kind of taking pot shots at me. But I was able to wrestle myself up and I was getting ready to fight back or whatever. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye that two of the guys were going after my girlfriend. Because she, this whole time, as they were kicking on me, she was probably hitting them in the back, but she was definitely screaming because I heard her and she was trying to get them to stop, you know. Well, one of them had a knife like this and he was walking towards her. So at that moment, I just, I, I just made my way to the van. I grabbed the gun. I got out of the back, hit pause. Now I'm standing there and I'll tell you, I felt crazy. I felt like what I was seeing wasn't real, um, and I did not have my wits about me. I was freaking out, and I could easily have shot somebody that night. I could have actually shot one of my brothers, you know, um, but I didn't, thank God. Resume play. <laughs> so two of the guys saw me come out with the gun, and they screamed, he's got a gun, and thankfully they all ran. So they ran, but... Um, this is the fog of war. I experienced it. I know what it feels like to have your life threatened, to have your loved one's life threatened, and, um, and what your brain does. It's just, it's not natural. Um, so let's apply this dynamic to um, the, the church warfare, the spiritual battle situation. Obviously, there's huge differences between, you know, the physical warfare and the biblical spiritual warfare that, that we've been looking at, that this Bible even says, it's, it's not the same. So this is Renovate's new building. Isn't it sexy? It's big. One of us could fit in there. And uh, there's a road that passes by. And we just put a brand new parking lot down. But there's only one entrance to that parking lot. You have to go in through that one slot to be able to get to us. Now imagine that someone's car is stalled in that entrance, okay? And they're blocking the way to our beautiful new 10 space parking lot, okay? And um, obviously no one would be able to come or go and it would significantly hinder, I mean, we would be shut down as a church, right? We wouldn't be able to do anything. So this car is a picture of how the enemy disrupts churches. And as you can see, I have a little acrostic there. Now, what car stands for, because obviously if it was a real car, we'd just go out there and move it. <laughs> but um, what it stands for is conflict, apathy, and rebellion. Now, I know I'm mixing metaphors a little bit here with our military, and now I'm doing a weird-looking whatever. Would it help if I put a tank in there? <laughs> no, no, it kind of ruins our, our acronym, doesn't it? Anyways, but, um, conflict, apathy, apathy, and rebellion are, are primary ways that the enemy um, attacks the work of the church. So let's look briefly at each of those. But I want to I work my ba way backwards because I'm going to spend a little more time on the conflict piece. But rebellion. Now imagine in our military scenario that a soldier just decided, I'm not going to follow orders. I'm not going to do what my commander asked me to do. I'm just going to do my own thing. And they abandon their post. And Now, this situation will not only jeopardize the mission, but it jeopardizes the other soldiers, doesn't it? See, in the same way, we all have um, a calling. We're all gifted. Now, there's, there's, the, there's the calling that is specific to our gift, in the kingdom, but then there's also the calling that's for all Christians, right? 
Go into all the world and make disciples, right? That's for all of us. There's stuff that's for all of us, and then there's... But it just doesn't go well when we say no to God. No, I'm not going to do what you say. Uh, you know, we just do our own thing. That's true in your personal life. That's what we've been looking at. But it's also true corporately, and it affects everybody. Secondly, apathy. Now, apathy in this context refers to kind of like half-heartedly following Jesus, which we know is not following Jesus at all. You know, when you seek me, seek me with your whole heart, and you'll find me if you seek me with your whole heart, right? That passage in Jeremiah. Um, this is basically just referring to, you know, very low-level commitment and sporadic a follow through, maybe you committed to do something, you may or may not do it, you may or may not show up for X, Y, or Z. You know, it's just a lack of passion for the things of God. Now, in both a military and in a church community setting, this causes some problems. First, think about the people who are serving, who are wholeheartedly committed. Well, when the, when the person who isn't doesn't show up, that burden falls to the ones who are. You know, that's true with giving, it's true with helping, it's true with attending, it's true with praying, it's true with everything. Okay, also, think about this. Now, personally, for me, um, it is very difficult dealing with ap apathetic people. This is one of the hardest parts of ministry because basically, we're pouring out our hearts trying to inspire and encourage people, you know, and it's like a, it's like an, a, a manual air pump, and we're just, we're going, you know, I, I want to inspire, I want to pump people up, I want to lead them, I want to instruct them, I want to teach them, I want to help them, you know, I want to save marriages, I want to, and you're doing this, but when it's with a person who's apathetic, that, it's like there's a big hole in the tire, and you go like this, and in a little while it just goes, and you're like, oh. <laughs> that's, that's literally how it feels. Ah, oh. if they would just follow through, it would change their lives, you know? And I know it's not that simple, and we've talked about a lot of that, but um, this obviously um, hinders the whole mission of whatever organization you're referring to. So finally, I want to I wanna spend a little more time on conflict. First, I need to explain what I mean by conflict because I, I'm not just referring to like disagreement or arguments and that type of stuff. It includes those things definitely, but how I'm using it is referring to the, to, it, it's the essence of the fog of war, this concept of the fog of war. And I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit. I want to start by giving you a few examples. Let's just say you showed up early to renovate tonight, and you walk in, <clears throat> and, um, and there's a few people in there, you walk by someone you know, and you say, hey man, how's it going? And they just, they don't even acknowledge you, they don't say hi, they don't reciprocate, maybe they heard you, maybe they didn't hear you, whatever, but it's, it's just kind of like a tweak, you know, fine, be that way, whatever. Or maybe... Maybe you made a suggestion and it's not followed. Maybe, um, maybe you have a gift. Like let's just say you have a gift for fixing things. And the only time anybody calls you is when you're going to fix something. Or maybe, you're, maybe your gift is giving and people are always trying to get you to give that to them. Or maybe it's exactly the opposite. Maybe, maybe you have these gifts and, and you're feeling underutilized. Nobody's asking you to do what you do best. Or maybe it's just this dynamic of it feels like there's an in and I'm not part of it. Now, back when I was a worship pastor, we did this thing called the worship forum. And there was about 40 people on the team and once a month we'd get together and it was a forum. We would talk about things. We would um, pray together, we'd pray for each other, we'd, we'd search out, God, what are you speaking to us as a team? What are you doing? I would share vision about stuff I felt God was showing me, and it was just a real sweet, amazing time. Well, this one specific worship forum, um, we, I, I became aware that a lot of people on the team 
were feeling really like I just described, like there's an in and they're on the outside. And it was significant. There was people considering stepping down and everything. So I addressed it in this. And, and I, I, I started by asking a question. I said, how many of you feel like there's an inside and you're not there, you're on the outside? You know, the, the ironic thing is almost all of them raised their hands. So I said, keep your hands up and look around. So they did. They went like this and they looked around. And I said, if, if, they're, if you're all on the outside, who's, who's on the inside? You know? Now, that's not to say that there's not an inside and outside. There are groups of people. I mean, I think of Renovate, um, and there's a small group of us that have worked together for many, many years, and we're very close, and some of us have close friendships. But let me tell you this. I know for a fact because I've heard it from them, that some of them feel on the outside. Why? How can that be? Because this is spiritual warfare. Do you understand? This is how the enemy works. Now, let me be clear. All of those things that I just described, they can be valid. There can be valid hurts, valid rejection, valid stupidity and, and, and things you know, I recently said something really stupid to Mark, and I had to go back to him and apologize to him, and he forgave me before I even asked, you know. But we do stuff like that, right? We just do. We're people. But it's what happens after that really matters. See, if we do it God's way, God's way happens. If we do it the enemy's way, the enemy's way happens. That's where warfare takes place. These type of weapons the enemy uses to launch brutal attacks on the church. And if we get caught up in them, if we're not handling them right, we end up shooting each other. Do you understand that? This is the fog of war. Oh, it hurts, it hurts. Brrr. But, praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. God has given us ways to combat this. And he gives us weapons to combat this. Look at this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. You see that? Wage war, weapons to fight with, not the weapons of the world. In the next verse, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against God, against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Do you notice here? He goes from weapons and warfare to arguments and, and pretension to set itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought, make it obedient to Christ, right? It goes into the mental realm. Do you understand that this is a battle of the heart or the spirit and the mind and the soul? And that's, that's it, right in line with what we've been talking about in this spiritual formation series. We need to be transformed in our minds, in our spirits, in our hearts as we approach how we do spiritual warfare. It's not pacing back and forth with a Bible reciting verses. It's having those verses inside of you, the sword of the Spirit, and we pull them out on the enemy but not just by saying them, by living them. You know, the devil doesn't have to show up in this room and start shooting at us. You know why? Because we're shooting each other. This is horrible. It's so sad what happens in the church. So here's the cool thing. 
Our weapons that we fight back with are the very things that are the tool for healing in relationship. Since a lot of this junk is valid because we're stupid, we do stupid things. Well, I'm not, sorry, we're not stupid. We just do stupid things. We hurt each other. We say terrible things. We do terrible things, right? Well, the tool of healing is the weapon against the enemy. Here's some of them. Communication. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Right? That's the sword of the spirit. That's a weapon and a tool of healing at the same time. Don't go talk to others about it until you go to the person that your offense is with. Because you're going you're gonna to cause that offense to happen that you're hurting them. And you're hurting the person that you're talking about. And you're hurting yourself and you're hurting the mission of God. Humility. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. How simple. Why can't we live this? It was humbling for me to go, Mark, man, what I said was really stupid. I'm so sorry. Avoid bitterness. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See, bitterness just doesn't hurt you. It causes trouble and it defiles many. Forgiveness. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Unity. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. You guys know something? There's no community without unity. Like what I did there? I know, I'm so corny, so pathetic. Anyway, let's look at our, our speaking of corny, let's look at our uh, little picture here again. How do we get that car out of the way? Well, we just push it, right? If that, was, if that really happened, we would just get out there and, and we'd push it out of the way because remember, it's stalled, it doesn't run. So we'd go out there and push it out of the way. But we can't all just run out there, check out my stick figures, we can't all just run out there and push on the car in every direction, right? Because it wouldn't move. We'd be fighting against each other. It requires unity. It requires that we all push on the same spot. Listen to me, you guys. In ministry, if we all push on the same spot, we will move something. We will move something by the power of God. We will change Parker. Why do you think it's so important for the enemy to get us to shoot at each other? It's the mission. It will shut down the mission. It destroys churches. We all have to deal with offensive things. If we handle them wrong, the enemy wins the battle. If we handle them right, the very same things that we use to hurt the enemy will heal each other. It will build up our character. It will build up our relationships. We will become stronger together. You know this. Those of you who have walked this for any number of years, you know this. And finally, love. Above all, because if we love each other, <laughs> this kind of covers it all. Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> wow. Love covers a multitude of sins. Can we just determine, renovate, that by the power of God's grace and every effort in us, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, all the effort within us, that we're going to do things God's way. We're going to follow the ways 
that God has so graciously giving us, given us because he knows that it will bless the heck out of us. Can we love each other? Can we refuse to gossip or talk about other people and how they hurt us? Go straight to them. Can we be humble? Can we be forgiving? Can we guard our unity with all our hearts? Let's pray. Father, once again, we're just in awe of how unbelievably you know people. How unbelievably, even today, you understand the dynamics of people in community and how things work. And you've given us a way. You've given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of you who called us by your own glory and goodness. So help us do that, God. And when we mess it up, help us just to get right back on the, the, the right track. In the name of Jesus.